will be too. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Three candidates, one goal. I can represent the small businesses better than anybody else who's in council right now. To be the next mayor of Columbia. I don't have a problem with rolling up my sleeves and getting in and working with people to get things done. Real issues, real questions from viewers like you. I'm the only person in this race who has that experience. Live from Chappelle Auditorium at Allen University, it's the 2021 Mayoral Forum. Good evening and welcome to our Columbia Mayor Candidate Forum from Chappelle Auditorium on the campus of Allen University. This building was declared a National Historic Landmark in 1976. The university was founded by the AME Church in 1870. And tonight, WLTX has partnered with the Columbia Urban League Young Professionals and Allen University to bring you this live event. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for News 19 at 7. I'm Darcy Strickland. Tonight, we are talking to the three individuals who are running for the office of mayor in the city of Columbia. Joining us live tonight, Mo Bedora, former Columbia city councilman who immigrated to the U.S. in 1980 to pursue the American dream. Tamika Isaac Devine, who currently holds the at-large seat on city council. Isaac Devine is an attorney and Columbia native passionate about the capital city. And Columbia native Sam Johnson, a former campaign aide to current mayor Steve Benjamin. Johnson believes he brings fresh ideas to tackle the city's biggest issues. A fourth individual who you will see on the ballot, Daniel Rickerman, was unable to join the forum tonight, he says due to a scheduling conflict. Tonight the candidates will answer questions from you, our viewers, about why they believe they are the best person to move the capital city forward. And this is your opportunity to make sure you participate in the forum tonight. You can text us your questions at 803-776-9508 and let us know what questions you have for these three candidates who are very eager to answer them. And don't forget to include your name. At this time, each candidate will be given two minutes to make an introductory statement to our audience here at Allen University and on all of our WLTX platforms. We're going to begin in alphabetical order today, beginning with Mo Bedora. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for having us. On January 16, 2019, Derek Caldwell Roper, age 31, Calvin Weatherspoon, age 62, found dead in their own bed while they were sleeping at the Ellen Bedding apartment, a public housing complex. Later, it was determined that the cause of death was carbon monoxide poisoning due to the negligence of lack of repairs. Soon after, it was, I was the only councilman that asked for accountability and demanded justice and asked the, for the director to resign. Later, it was determined no, no criminal charges will be issued and no one is responsible for the death of two poor citizens. Many will say that this incident was swept under the carpet. That's why as mayor, I will fight to stop corruption and demand justice for all citizens. I will also establish community policing and bring back police substations in our neighborhood to encourage and strengthen the relationship between our police officers and our community. I will also invest in the water and sewer department and stop the transfer for water and sewer. After I left the office in 2019, this council has also continued to transfer funds from water and sewer, which could affect the quality of life and the quality of the water that you are receiving every day. We will expand our water and sewer lines to attract more subdivision built so we can attract more young people for first-time home buyers. I will eliminate small business license fee. Any business with less than three, three employees or less and $500,000 in revenue will no longer be paying a business license fee. And lastly, I will encourage and, and motivate other companies to come and hire all the young talent that we have here in Columbia to stay and raise their families with us in our great city. At the same time, get a great paying jobs for everything that we do. Thank you so much for your time. 
Next, Tamika Isaac Devine will deliver an opening statement. Thank you, Ms. Strickland, uh, and to Dr. McNeely, the, great, the president of this great organization, and uh, Mr. Taylor, and all of you who are watching. I'm Tamika Isaac Devine, your current at-large member of Columbia City Council and candidate for mayor of the city of Columbia. Columbia is home for me. This is the city that raised me. It is the city where I started my career as a practicing attorney many years ago. It is the city where I met and married my husband, who is a Benedict College grad, uh, and the city where we have intentionally decided to raise our three children. It's the city that has taught me about community and has taught me about service. And I've been honored to humbly serve this city for the last 19 years. Together, we have done so much from facing our quickest challenges like the 2008-2009 recession, the great flood of 2015, and even now as we continue to navigate through COVID-19 to make sure that we are not only addressing the immediate health challenges, but we're taking advantage of opportunities as we come out of this and addressing the disparities that this pandemic has unearthed. We've also expanded programs for our youth. We've worked to expand financial empowerment We've made st strong strategic investments in our community while making sure that we have investment in our parks and our infrastructure. We've done a lot together, but there's still so much left to be done. And that's why I'm running for mayor. I'm running for mayor of the city of Columbia to be an independent voice, someone who champions all communities, no matter where you live, and promoting, promote, promoting excuse me, inclusive and equitable growth throughout the city. So no matter where you live, whether you live in Shandon or North, um, North Columbia, or you live in Rosewood, Wood Creek Farms, or Harbison, that you know you have a champion in the mayor's office. Someone who will wake up every single day, rolling up her sleeves and going to work with you and for you. Making sure that we are promoting inclusive growth, that we're expanding and working for working families. Making sure that people can not only pay their bills, but they can be strong and survive. Making sure that we're investing in our infrastructure and growing this amazing city. So I look forward to this panel, and thank you for being here. Now our next candidate, Sam Johnson, in his opening statement. First, I'd like to start by thanking the Columbia Urban League Young Professionals uh, for putting this together, the uh, folks who worked really hard to organize this conversation this evening. Also, I want to uh, thank uh, our president here, uh, this fine institution. It's uh, amazing and a great opportunity to be back on Allen University's campus. And of course, uh, Darcy and uh, WLTX for uh, this forum this evening. I wanted to open up tonight by talking about how my name is Sam Johnson and I was born and raised here in Columbia, how I'm the son of a truck driver and an Alzheimer's nurse. And I wanted to give you guys my bio. But I'll tell you, I had an opportunity to sit down with the city's fire department yesterday, with our firefighters. And we have a crisis on our hands right now. We have 60 vacancies in our fire department. 60 vacancies, 60 firefighters that are missing. We have 10 fire trucks right now that just yesterday were running short of the personnel that they need to serve you, to keep you safe. We have one fire truck, one fire truck operating yesterday where most of their equipment is broken. Life-saving equipment that they don't have to keep you safe. Matter of fact, as the capital city, we are right now borrowing equipment to make sure that we have the life-saving equipment necessary from a vendor. On top of that, on top of that, our firefighters start pay at just $10.50 an hour. These are, these are our heroes, y'all. We've got to do better. And on top of that, we have a gun violence crisis. In Gable Oaks, just last week, we had three consecutive nights of shootings. We have to address that. But I'll tell you, in addition to the 60 vacancies that we have in the fire department, we have over 90 vacancies in our police department. We have to have leadership, vision, and action if we're going to be able to address this and move the needle forward. And so that's why I'm running for mayor. I want to provide that action. I want to make sure that we address these challenges head on. Thank you so much, Sam. All right, we're going to have some housekeeping rules, if you all will bear with me for just a moment just to explain to you how this evening is going to go. Each candidate will respond to the same question. Each candidate will have one minute to answer that question. There is no rebuttal time. This is not a debate. This is a forum. It's an opportunity for you, the voters, to hear from the candidates. We're gonna rotate who has asked the first question, and we will go in alphabetical order, starting with Mr. Badora. You've probably noticed the lights right here in front of you. The green is your go, the yellow means you have 15 seconds, and the red means we're asking you to stop, your time is up. 
So we'll begin with our first question. Perhaps the most important topic for discussion tonight is how the city and its leaders, namely the mayor, will navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. The Delta variant of COVID-19 has impacted every aspect of every life. People have lost loved ones, students, and schools have been changed forever. Families have lost homes and jobs. And just today, DHEC has confirmed more than 4,200 new cases of the coronavirus across the state. So the first question for our candidates this evening is, in the midst of the COVID surge, voters in the capital city want to know what is your plan? We'll begin with Mr. Padora. Um, so COVID is an important, important uh, topic to discuss, uh, and vaccination is even more important. As mayor, I will be in every corner, every street in the city promoting vaccination. Number two, wear mask anywhere you go. It is important that we protect ourselves and protect others from getting, the, the vac getting uh, contaminated or get the virus, uh, because it's, it's a way to make sure that our city is safe and our citizens are safe. The third thing is motivate citizens to go and get vaccine shots by and giving them money for uh, their vaccine card. So, uh, and I think the city has passed a resolution last week or so to do the same thing for their employees. And I think we could do the same thing for citizens in Columbia, that if they get vaccinated, you, they get compensated for it, anyway from 300 to $500. Thank you. Ms. Devine. Thank you so much. You know, COVID-19 has unearthed a lot of disparities within our city. Uh, we have to face the immediate health challenges while also taking advantage of the opportunities that COVID-19 has. Uh, as a council person, I have been from the day one meeting with our partners in Richmond County and DHEC, uh, nonprofits and churches to make sure that we are educating our community about COVID-19. Not just about what COVID-19 is, but how do you protect yourself? As a council member, I voted uh, for the very first uh, uh, stay at home order and then for masks. I've consistently voted uh, following the guidance by the CDC and DHEC to make sure that we are protecting ourselves. And then once the vaccine was available, I've continued to go throughout the city and make sure that not only people understood about the vaccine, but we had town halls to make sure that people were educated about it. As mayor, I will continue to lead on this and not only uh, make sure we're promoting the vaccines, but making sure that our citizens are informed and that we continue to help address health disparities within our community. Mr. Johnson? I'll tell you, this is personal for me. I've lost my aunt, my mom's sister, I lost my grandmother and my grandfather to COVID-19. I'll tell you, we have a zip code in this city right now that leads for so many different health disparities. But I'll also tell you that it leads in the state for COVID infections. So we've got to make sure that as we deal with uh, this pandemic, that we, are, that we are utilizing new, fresh ideas. The very first day, or excuse me, the third day of our campaign, we put out an idea called the Chief Health Officer recognizing that not only do we have the health disparities here that affect diabetes, hypertension, and so many other uh, uh, negative health impacts, we also have this pandemic right here on our hands. And so the first thing I would do is hire a chief health officer so we have somebody who has the data. We don't need somebody, we, we've had elected officials who have tried to uh, say that, hey, we're gonna be a champion or we're gonna tell you what the science says. We need a, uh, somebody who is based in science, who, who has that type of of, of background to make sure that they are leading our efforts with data. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Our next question, Tamika Isaac Devine will answer first. This question is from a WLTX viewer. Her name is Mimi. She wants to know, will you follow CDC guidelines in the fight against COVID-19 to help keep the city and schools safe? After Ms. Devine, we will hear from Mr. Johnson and then Mr. Bedora. Well, thank you, Mimi, for that question, and that is so very important. We need to make sure that we have elected officials who not only understand uh, that we have to be led by the data and the science, but that you follow that and you don't po uh, politicize this COVID-19 pandemic or any other health disparity uh, for political expediency, but that we're following the guidance, and not only that, but we're educating our citizens. So yes, I will follow the CDC guidance, the DHEC guidance, but in addition to that, uh, as the mayor, I will make sure that we're having uniform meetings, regular meetings with our partners to make sure that we're in encouraging uh, the following of the guidance and also educating and answering questions. There are so many uh, misinformation, disinformation out there about COVID-19. And so as leaders, it's very important that we hit that head on and that we address people and meet people where they are and make sure we're providing them with the right information and data. 
So absolutely. It, there are so much, there's so much misinformation. There's so many uh, folks who have so many questions. And they, they ask the question, hey, how do I find out? You know, who can I, is there somebody at the city of Columbia that can answer this question? I've been contacted by a neighborhood president who said, hey, I want to, I want to lead an effort. I want to lead a vaccination effort. Is there somebody at the city of Columbia who can, who can make sure that I know which zip codes, which uh, communities that I have to, to have to impact if we're going to stop the spread of this virus here in Columbia. And so not only do we have to make sure that there is somebody that you can pick up the phone and call, we have to have the type of leadership that when our governor, uh, when different leaders across our state are unwilling to show the type of leadership that is necessary to save lives, that we have a mayor who's willing to do an emergency declaration to make sure that our children are able to go to school with masks. That means you have to have a leader who's going to be willing to be the tip of the spear, who's going to be willing to put put in bold action. And that's the type of leader that, that, that we need here in Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Bedora. Um, uh, as mayor, uh, leadership is very important here. Uh, is it, it is important not to play politics with people's feelings and when they're sick or there's a, a pandemic in the, in the area and in our city. It is important to reach out to our school officials, council, um, superintendent, principals, teachers, and educate them the proper way and how to go about vaccine and how to administer vaccine and how you can make the vaccine available. It's important that we communicate that information with our parents, with the parents and the students itself. And of course, the, the public, the uh, teachers and the principals and the public official that oversees our school system. It is most far important uh, for us to deliver the right information rather than playing politics and worry about what you can do as a, as a public official. This is beyond politics. This is serious business and we need to address it fast. Thank you. Now let's discuss healthcare just a little bit more broadly. Access to quality and meaningful healthcare, especially in South Carolina, is becoming an increasingly severe challenge for so many people. We'll begin with Mr. Johnson with this question from a viewer. As the leader of the capital city, what plans do you have for people living in the city to ensure every individual has the opportunity to get both affordable and purposeful health care from, uh, from providers, I should say, in rural and urban areas? Sure. So as I mentioned, the third day of our campaign, we came out with the idea of a chief health officer. And I will tell you, it wasn't a popular idea by, by amongst my competitors. And I will tell you, the, the conversation that I've heard is, well, no, we have, we're in the capital city, we have all these nonprofit organizations, we have hospital systems here. But yet, while we have those resources here available to us, we continue to see zip codes and actual sections of our community, of our city, unfortunately, that disproportionately impacted and affected. Because not only has this happened like the last few years, this has been the case for 20 and 30 years where we are seeing one side of Columbia have a life expectancy 10 years shorter than the other side. We've got to make sure that we bring fresh new ideas to the table that are going to allow us to move the needle here in Columbia. And so that chief health officer will allow us to make sure that we are eradicating some of these challenges that our leaders up until this point have not been able to get done. Thank you. Mr. Bedora? Uh, so it's important to uh, reach out to the nonprofit local churches and other communities to support each other when it comes to that. It is important that we reach out and make the vaccine or, or the, any medical uh, attention necessary for uh, underprivileged available everywhere in the city. Uh, as mayor, as a leader of the city, I think I will take that in initiative to every neighborhood and every uh, church and every corner of the, of the city, of every corner of the street uh, to make sure that we spread the, the right gospel and uh, communicate the right language and the right communication with the people. Thank you. Ms. Isaac Devine. Thank you. A lot of people will tell you what they will do, but you look at what people have done. Since I've been on city council, I've been a champion and a leader when it comes to health care. I have uh, founded the Citywide Wellness Challenge, actually worked together at Prison Health to address health disparities in 29203. And one of the things our survey showed us is that the reason that you have so many health disparities and access to health care issues is because of systemic racism and not addressing these issues head on. And so when we look at health disparities, whether it be lack of sidewalks so people can't walk, um, if, it look, if it is uh, access to fresh fruits and vegetables, those are things that a leader, the city has to lead on. 
As mayor, uh, I will have the ability to really lead a lot of these issues more than I've done so far. I've been, done a great job as a council member, but as mayor, I'll be able to not only bring resources, but also address the fact that we have to work together with our partners and not create new bureaucratic um, positions that will, be, oh, um, that will not actually get the job done. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from a viewer named Virginia. She says, after moving here a year ago and becoming a registered voter, I couldn't believe the difficulty I experienced finding a primary care physician. The question from Virginia reads, what does each candidate plan to do to improve the health care system and get primary care physicians to come to Columbia and stay? We'll begin with Mr. Bador. Oh, well, great question. Um, it, it is important that we recruit uh, the, the best uh, to our city and our um, health care providers. Uh, I, I think it's important that um, as mayor or leader of the city to be on commercial and try to promote uh, such individuals and maybe some bonuses to offer them to bring them here. Uh, we've talked about tax incentives in the past. Uh, we, we've offered this a little bit, I think, for uh, our police officers and firemen in our uh, city government that uh, they can get a lower um, uh, interest rate to buy their home within the city limits. And I think we can probably offer the same, uh, extend the same offer uh, to other uh, uh, individuals just like healthcare workers. Thank you. Ms. Isaac Devine. Thank you. And thank you for that question, Virginia. Um, I'll tell you that I've gone to the same primary care physician uh, since I became an adult. Several years ago, he retired, uh, and his practice was bought by uh, Providence. You know, Providence has continued to go down uh, in our community, uh, and then Prisma Health uh, was bought out by Greenville, and the monopoly at, of Prov uh, excuse me, of Prisma has expanded. As mayor, I think it's very important that we make sure that we have competition. Uh, but more importantly, uh, Virginia's question asked about how do we recruit physicians so that they come and stay. For the city is a part for us to work with now MUSC, who has now had Providence um, and Prisma Health and Lexington, and make sure that we have quality health care facilities so that they are being paid. But we also need to make sure we have a good quality of life so that when they come here, they know that they have a great city to live in. And that means low uh, cost of living as well as great amenities. And as mayor, that is part of the mayor's job to champion, and I will continue to do that. Mr. Johnson. Sure. We can't say that we've done the work but at the same time still have the same challenges that continue to exist here in Columbia. We've got to make sure, guys, that we're electing leaders who are actually moving the needle. We can't have health care, health care where we have folks who are 20 and 30 years, 40 years, not seeing the, the, the fruits of that labor. So we've got to make sure that we are, are doing work that actually moves the needle here in Columbia. And so when we talk about how do we make sure that we have physicians, that we have access to health care. We've got to have an economy here that allows for them, that we have the, the culture here that allows for them to, to come and see the climate that allows for them to, uh, to see a Columbia that's growing and thriving. You know, we talk about MUSC coming to Columbia. That would not have happened if we didn't have a Bull Street that allowed for a campus to, to create a campus that MUSC could come to. So we've got to have a leader that provides the economic development infrastructure for the, for the fruit of that labor to come to Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. We're going to transition now and talk about infrastructure around the capital city. We received a lot of questions from viewers about grocery stores noticeably absent in some areas of the city. How would you work to encourage other grocery stores to expand in the city, and what are you doing to reverse this process of companies moving out of the city? We'll begin with Mrs. Isaac Devine. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, it is very important that we address not just food deserts, but make sure we have diversity of food options. I mentioned before in the previous question is that when you look at the reason that we have a health disparities and a lot of issues, these aren't issues that are 20, 30 year issues. These are issues that are 50 and 60 year issues. And you need someone who is gonna be willing to confront those issues head on and address uh, issues that people don't want to talk about, and that is systemic racism and disinvestment in communities of color. Yes, it's great to have Bull Street and spend millions of dollars for that, but we need to have the mayor that will have the same dedication and passion to invest in North Columbia and Two Notch Road and communities of color that aren't going to bring all these big, big businesses that don't hire 
people from communities of color that are affected by these health disparities. And so as mayor, not only will I champion investment, strategic investment in communities of color, but I'll also make sure that we have communities uh, or we have uh, minority business owners who will have a piece of that pie and they can establish grocery stores in the communities where they live. Mr. Johnson. Absolutely. We have to have a mayor who has a track record of bringing economic development to Columbia and knows how to utilize the right tools to provide that, that, those opportunities. So when we look at grocery stores and we look at the opportunities to bring grocery stores into our neighborhoods, we have to have the economic tools, the incentives that allow for us to be able to attract them. We have to be able to use tools like economic overlay districts, something that will allow us to be able to attract the right type of development, create the right type of climate, and have grocery stores up and down North Main and Ferrell Road so that we deal with some of these food deserts head on. We gotta have a mayor who makes sure that when we look at some of the inequity that we have here, that we can have the type of economic growth that creates a climate where we have the density that we need to make sure that we support those grocery stores. And so as mayor, we need to make sure that we are focusing on making sure that we have all the tools necessary to see the type of growth that we have to have here in Columbia so that our children are able to live up to their potential and we have the resources for our grandmothers as well. Mr. Bedora. Thank you for that question. I, uh, it, th this is a problem. It's been, uh, it's been occurring a lot more lately, uh, and it's important that we can address it in the future, not now, but also in the future. Uh, in the past, uh, I didn't vote for it, but the Bull Street, which the city of Columbia spent over $100 million on Bull Street. Uh, a lot of the council members uh, voted for uh, giving half the taxes off for student housing to be built anywhere, everywhere in the city. But it's, nobody ever talked about getting tax incentives for grocery stores to come into the neighborhoods where they really need it. Me, as mayor, I will make sure I will go and uh, bring those grocery stores in our neighborhoods. As a businessman, I have acquired a lot of com communication, a lot of relationship with other businesses that I know how to talk to them and I know how to incentivize them for them to come and build a grocery store and open one in our neighborhoods as we need it. Public uh, community policing always helps and to bring in the grocery stores in our uh, neighborhood as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Padora. Another topic with a lot of interest from our viewers focused on the needs of individuals without homes. Mr. Johnson, you'll be the first to answer this question, followed by Mr. Padora and Mrs. Isaac Devine. As mayor, exactly what would you do to address the long-term needs of the homeless? Sure. Homia is, is home for me. It's a place that I'm so proud to be from. We have such humanity in the city. But I'll tell you guys, I live in Elmwood Park, and as I stand in a, or park at uh, the corner of Elmwood and Park Street, you know, I see folks who are old enough, you know, my mother, my grandmother, walking with book bags with all their lifely uh, possessions in 95 degree heat, or in 34 degrees uh, cold and rain. We've got to have a better system here in Columbia. We have to have a conversation where we look at how we deliver services to those in need right now. We have folks here who try to go to Transitions or Oliver Gospel, sandwiched between our, our commercial business districts and our downtown neighborhoods. Folks who will walk all the way around the city looking for services. We have to have a campus where we provide the services that folks need and, they, and then also provide the transitional housing that people need all in one location so that we provide the services, the care, all that and address those challenges head on through something that is systematic that doesn't leave people searching. Mr. Bedour. So there's two, part of the, uh, uh, two answers or two parts of the answer to this question. So number one, of course, we need to establish uh, a shelter, a year-round shelter uh, that, that, that house the homeless temporarily until permanent solutions are fixed for them. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, nonprofits around the city that can feed and house and, and try to help the homeless as much as they can, but 6 o'clock it's cutoff time. So what do you do from homeless, for the homeless society from 6 o'clock or 8 o'clock at night until the next day? That's why you need a shelter. If you have a homeless sitting outside after they miss the deadline, it is important that you get them to the shelter where the shelter can take them the following day to the necessary services that they need. Anywhere in the city, we have a lot of offices in here that can help the homeless society, and it's important that we have a shelter that can motivate or try to uh, help those people as much as possible, especially after hours. The other one is have a, a, a facility that you can house 25 to 30 people at a time, try to give them the help and the tools and the training for a new job so they can go out there after a period of two or three months to go out there and get their own job 
and have their own place to live forever. Thank you. Ms. Lavik Devon. Thank you so much. Uh, so several years ago, there was a lot of conversation about how we were going to uh, address our unsheltered brothers and sisters. There was a lot of conversation about shelters. There was a lot of conversations about moving them out of the city of Columbia. Uh, but I said that is not the issue, and that's not the solution. We have to have someone who's going to work forward to real solutions. Uh, as a council person, I propose the homeless court. We are the first homeless court in the state of South Carolina. Now there are six other homeless courts that are patterned after us. We've won national awards. And what we do is we understand that there's diversity in our unsheltered citizens. One size fits all will not work. We have to address the underlying issues, whether it is mental illness, whether it is substance abuse issues, whether it's financial difficulties. And we have to make sure we're meeting them where they are, that we have short-term sustainable solutions, but we also have long-term solutions in getting people into permanent housing. Uh, as affordable housing is one solution, also making sure that we're understanding how we are going to have that wraparound services and address all the other issues uh, that might be um, plaguing our unsheltered brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can all agree we've gotten some really great information from all of our candidates so far this evening. Let's give them a round of applause. There is another half hour of our Columbia Mayor's Forum coming up. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Stay with us. Three candidates, one goal. I can represent the small businesses better than anybody else who's in council right now. To be the next mayor of Columbia. I don't have a problem with rolling up my sleeves and getting in and working with people to get things done. Real issues, real questions from viewers like you. I'm the only person in this race who has that experience. Live from Chappelle Auditorium at Allen University, it's the 2021 Mayoral Forum. Bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the historic campus of Allen University, where 
Three of the four candidates who want to be the next mayor of the city of Columbia are joining us today. This is a forum. It is not a de debate. So each of you at home and those of you in the audience have submitted questions. Each one of our candidates will have an opportunity to answer that question. There is no rebuttal because we want to get as many of your questions answered as possible. So our first question coming in from a viewer who is watching at home. We'll start with Mr. Bedora with this question. The viewer wants to know, how will you keep new graduates from the University of South Carolina, Allen University, Benedict College, those who graduate from colleges here in Columbia, what will you do to make sure they stay in the capital city? Great question. Um, the first thing we need to concentrate on is improve the quality of life. We have to understand that we have to make our city safe. Community policing and substations in our neighborhood what will bring our safety to our neighborhood. Number two, as a businessman, as I mentioned before, I have acquired relationship with a lot of companies around, around the country. And it's important for me that we can use our tax incentives to promote those companies back over here so they can hire our new graduates right away, rather than move in somewhere else and so they can find another job. It is important that we bring companies in here that hires fifty, sixty thousand dollars jobs, that we can accommodate them and have the talent right here stay in Columbia. Number three, we have to make sure that we work with our technical college in, uh, colleges to uh, find a train or greater trade for anybody that's interested in getting into technical colleges, all expenses paid. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is a great question. We, we know that young people, college graduates, tend to go where they want to live and then find opportunities. And so we have to make sure that we have opportunities here, but that we also have a great quality of life. Uh, we have to understand what are some of the challenges that new graduates have. You know, when I talk about affordable housing, and I currently chair the Affordable Housing Task Force um, uh, that we just formed last year after several years um, of asking the mayor to do an affordable housing task force, he get, granted me the opportunity to chair that task force. In the short year that we've been meeting, we have identified the diversity of housing needs and the gap that is needed here in the city of Columbia. When people graduate, they need to be able to have a quality, affordable place to live that's not taking all their income. So that is one, one thing. We also have to make sure that we have a great quality of life and that we're addressing uh, our growth in an equitable way and uh, appreciating that diversity we have. Young people look to places where there is vibrant life and that comes with diversity and equitable opportunities. And so as mayor, I will champion those equitable opportunities and take advantage of our diversity here in the city of Columbia. Well, I'll tell you, so if we're gonna make sure that we retain and attract the talent that we have the ability to do, we have 60,000 students who graduate from the University of South Carolina, Benedict College, Allen University, Midlands Technical College every year here in our community. We're talking about a population in this city of 130,000. So we're graduating 60,000 kids a year. If we're able to harness that energy, if we're able to make sure that we're keeping that talent here in our community, you can only imagine what the, what the potential of Columbia is. But we gotta make sure, guys, that we are doing things like developing our river, like we're uh, creating the type of jobs and harnessing the technology economy jobs that we have the ability to do right here in Columbia. If we're able to make sure that we're creating live, work, play districts here in this city so that people can enjoy themselves, we've gotta make sure, though, guys, that we conquer the basics that we have safe communities, that our children, that our children's children, so as we retain and attract that talent, that they're gonna be able to put their kids in a school district that they feel comfortable and safe in. So we've gotta make sure that we conquer the basics, y'all. Thank you. Our next question will begin with Ms. Isaac Devine. What are some positive programs in the Columbia Police Department's strategic plan, specifically the section on policing in the 21st century challenges and opportunities? Well, there are lots of positive opportunities that we're doing right now. We have an amazing police chief, um, one that a lot of folks wanted um, us to consolidate law enforcement. Uh, but we, our city manager went through a aggressive search and we found a great police chief who has been bringing forward lots of great programs. Some of those programs we have worked on uh, to promote is uh, building more relationships within the city of Columbia with our neighborhoods. Uh, we've got, we're out and about with our citizens, but what I really want to talk about is some programs that we need to expand upon. You know, as the next mayor, I think that we have to make sure that we're not only building relationships with the communities, but that we have our law enforcement in communities. 
That's why I have already proposed having, bringing back residential COBOL, and I've talked to the police chief about that, making sure that we have those dilapidated houses, we fix those up, and we have officers who are living in the communities that they serve. Also look at building a partnership with Allen University so that we can train uh, criminal justice majors to come into our police department so we can expand uh, the opportunities, especially the diversity of our police. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. During my time in the mayor's office, I had an amazing opportunity to lead, under President Obama's tenure, the 21st Century Policing Task Force Guidelines. And in implementing those, some of those, of course, were uh, the implementation of body cameras, uh, you know, different community policing opportunities. So we look at you know, the ice cream truck, the opportunity for, uh, for us to have, a, have our police officers out in communities with, with an ice cream truck that our police department purchased. And so we've got to make sure that we're being very creative. I remember our My Brother's Keeper initiative where we were able to work with our school district and our police officers to work on that engagement and build that trust in our community. But I'm going to tell you guys, all that was great and I enjoyed it during my time in the mayor's office. But as I let out, we have 93 vacancies right now in our police department. We don't have the manpower to get officers out of their patrol cars and into the communities and make sure that we're building that trust and they're having the time and the energy, the resources necessary to make the impact that they have to make to keep our children safe and alive and to build that trust in our communities. Thank you. Mr. Bedore. Um, community, uh, once again, community policing is uh, what I go back to reference to. It is important that we bring back the community policing in our neighborhoods and open substations in our neighborhoods so we can strengthen the, the relationship between our police officers and our community. It is important that we uh, give our police officers more money for to recruit uh, the best recruits and the best hires and the police officers in the country. It is important that we support our police officers and our police chief, and not only that, but our firemen to continue doing what the, what the job they do. As a volunteer fireman, and I was a volunteer fireman for eight years, I know what they go through, I know how dangerous that job is. We have to do everything we can in our power as mayor and city government to help, these, to help our police officers and firemen to not worry about everyday expenses, but worry about what they can do and how many lives they can save. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this next question is from our partners at the Columbia Urban League Young Professionals. During the last several years, there has been increased attention to disproportionate policing in communities of color. What are some positive changes that you've seen personally in Columbia? A little more clarity there. Clarity from someone Positive from changes. when it comes to policing specifically oh. in areas that may have been, and I'm just going to assume I'm asking this question correctly, over-policed in the past. Sure. So you know, I talked just a second ago about the importance of building that trust. Um, and so I mentioned the ice cream truck, for example. To me, that was an amazing opportunity for our police department to have a, have a tool, have, a, have an opportunity to go out and uh, not be in a community for any other reason but to build that trust, to work with our young people and, and to uh, make sure that that relationship, that rapport exists. Um, and so to me, that's a step in the right direction. And uh, under Chief Holbrook's uh, leadership, I'm happy to see that happening. But we've got to make sure that that continues to happen, that we have the manpower and the uh, and the resources to move that, move that forward. And so right now, of course, as you look past COVID, as we look as, at the opportunity for us to have that personal person interaction, we don't have the opportunity coming out of COVID to make sure that that continues, to make sure that that type of rapport and that trust is built because we don't have the manpower. We don't have the leadership to make sure that we have actual officers to build that trust. Mr. Bedore? So uh, communication is key. Um, when I talk about community policing and uh, uh, bring substations, uh, police substations back in our neighborhood, that's a really, uh, it's a first step, right? The second step is we need to, um, for the police officers in the police department, they need to address every situation different. You can't come into a situation with a gun ho, guns drawn, try to calm things down. That's not going to help. We have to look at ways that we can address how we can communicate with, with communities and address how we can handle every situation is different. It is important that we communicate with our community leaders and our community and our everyday citizens how we can improve our life better. And it's important that we can do that by community policing and open police substations in our neighborhood so everybody can understand and know each other at the same time 
strengthening our relationship between our police officers and our community and each other because it's important that we build love between our community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Several positive changes we've had is the utilization of technology. Uh, we were the first um, agency, even before it was mandated, to have body cameras. Uh, that didn't happen with one person. That happened with the organized effort of making sure that we had leadership in the city of Columbia, not only to make it a priority, but to vote for it. Uh, in addition to technology with body cameras, we have our shot spotter, which is state-of-the-art technology so that we're identifying gun violence in our communities and being able to respond timely. Once people know in your communities that we, police will respond, because we know that a lot of people weren't even calling when there were gunshots, then they know that there's a trust. They're building that trust within the police, with the police department and will be there. We've also established great partnerships, like great organizations like Serve and Connect, uh, where we're in the communities, not just uh, with an ice cream truck, but also reading to kids, playing football with kids, and making sure we're building those relationships. We also have hired a social worker at my urging to make sure that when we are responding, we're not just responding with law enforcement, but we're responding to meet people where they are and what their needs are, because we have so many people who have adverse childhood experiences and a social trauma that we've got to address. Thank you all so much. It's hard to believe, but we are now 45 minutes into our hour forum. And so before we give you all an opportunity to give your closing statements, we're going to move into what we're calling the lightning round. And so we're going to go in alphabetical order again, starting with Mr. Padora, and then we'll keep it in that order because these are answers that are specific to each one of you, okay? So you can't really cheat off your neighbor's paper with, this, with, this, with these questions. All right, <laughs> so here we go with the lightning round. Um, we're calling it lightning because each of you should be able to answer these questions with one to two words, all right? So we're not even gonna start the clock on that. You guys ready? All right, here we go. First question. What's the price of a gallon of gas and a gallon of milk, starting with Mr. Bedora? Two sixty-eight a gallon, and uh, I guess what depends what kind of milk, Three sixty-eight. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mr. Devon? Oh, the same question. We same question. Okay. Everybody's got the same question. <laughs> okay. Um, my, my gas is probably like two eighty, uh, and I drink almond milk, so it's like four twenty-five. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Johnson? So I drive an electric vehicle, uh, so I haven't bought gas. Uh, I try to uh, reduce my footprint, and I'm lactose intolerant, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Again, as we just said, these are specific questions to you, so this, this should work out. All right, Mr. Bedora, and then everyone answers this same question. Who is your personal hero? Oh, um, Carol Campbell. Mr. Vine? My parents. Mr. Johnson. Mary P. Starks, my grandmother. Mountains or coast? Mr. Bedore? What was the I'm sorry. Mountains or, or coast? coast? Did, are you going to the mountains coast? or are you heading oh, to the coast? Coast, coast, beach, baby. <laughs> <laughs> coast. I don't get to say my wife would tell you the coast, so I'm going with her. <laughs> All right. Mr. Bedore, how do you handle stress? Uh, work in my yard and uh, have projects around the house. Mr. Vine, pray. Mr. Johnson. Say, I work out. What's your favorite city park? Um, I live in Shandon, so it would have to be Sims because I've invested a lot of time with my boys over there. Mr. Vine, Roy Lynch Park. We live in adjoining neighborhoods, so I would say Roy Lynch Park as well. All right, final question. And we got 15 seconds to wrap this whole thing up. Clemson or Carolina? Gamecocks, baby. <laughs> Mr. Vine? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Carolina. Mr. Johnson? We're 2 0. Carolina. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's give all of our candidates another huge round of applause. We are now going to allow each of our candidates to issue their closing statements. We'll start with Mr. Bedora, go to Ms. Isaac Devine, and then we'll wrap up with Mr. Johnson. Um, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for organizing this event. It has been a great pleasure to be here and uh, see all of you again and, and to meet some of the new faces. Uh, it is important to address again, once again, I have uh, I've mentioned before 
I emigrated to the city in, in 1980, August 4th, 1980. I came to see my uncle, uh, Uncle Andy of Andy's Deli, the late Uncle Andy of Andy's Deli. He told me everything I need to do about work and work ethics and be honest and work hard about everything you do. I've gone to college, I've graduated from USC twice, and I want to clean the city because I really care. I, this is the only city that I, be, I believe it's my home. It is the only city that I've lived longer than anywhere else in my life. It is the only city that welcomed me from the first day I came to Columbia. And I care about the city because a lot of things. I want to improve the city for my children, for the children in the future. But we can't do that just saying that and, and going around and shaking hands. So my platform is this. We need to stop corruption. We need to go after every dirty politicians out there that's trying to utilize our taxpayers' money. We need to improve our public safety by bringing community policing back in our community, by opening subs police substations in our neighborhood to strengthen the, the relationship between our police officers and our communities. Number three, we need to invest in our infrastructure. It is the simple, basic duty for city government to open or turn on your faucet at the, every day and have a clean water. For many years, this city has been transferring money from water and sewer into other funds. And now we need to go back to that state. We need to stop that and not happening and reinvest in the water and sewer and keep, keep our infrastructure clean. Number four, we need to stop the uh, business license fee for small businesses. Any small business with $500,000 in revenue uh, and under four employees, there will be no business license fee. We've done the study on this, and I can make this happen as mayor. As a small businessman, it will eliminate the red tape, it will eliminate the headache of worry about a business license fee every single year that it comes up. It is important that we support our small businesses because it is the backbone in every local economy. I don't have to tell you that. Everybody tells that. It's a fact. Number four, we need to bring big companies to hire and keep our young talents here. I've said it before. It is my connection to, with the business world out there. I can bring companies so we can hire the new talent or the fresh or young talent that's graduating for our universities and college in town. It is important. It is important that we keep them here so they can raise their family. I would love your vote on November 2nd. It is important cycle of election. It is the turn. It is the way we can turn this city around. I don't want to tell you about my past experiences with the city government. It is time to move forward and bring fresh ideas and brief concept to our city. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here, and thank you for your attention. Um, I'm Tamika Isaac Devine, and I'm running for mayor to be an independent voice, someone who is championing all communities and, prom and pro excuse me, and promoting inclusive and equitable growth within the city. And when I say that, I mean that. Um, I have been serving the city uh, as an at-large council person. I've done the work while raising a family, having two full-time jobs, and um, serving the city. Without city staff um, in the mayor's office and without, honestly, the salary of the mayor, because I love the city. It's not about a title for me. It's not about a stepping stone. It's about someone who can wake up every single day roll up her sleeves and get to work for you. Making sure that we're building an equitable city, that we are addressing our issues, but also taking advantage of our opportunities. When we look at healthcare and COVID-19, we see the healthcare disparities, but we also see economic disparities. We also see social justice issues. We also see environmental justice issues. These things didn't happen overnight, and they won't, serve, they won't get solved overnight. And they certainly won't get solved without someone who understands these issues deeply and is well, willing to fight to address these issues. I've had the honor to work with two amazing mayors, Mayor Coble and Mayor Benjamin. But now it's time that we have a new leader, someone who is going to understand this community and not care how much money you make, where you live, or who your political friends but someone who is going to understand that every single person in this community deserves a champion in the mayor's office, deserves a phone call returned, deserves somebody who's gonna listen, and even if she can't solve every single issue that they have, that she's gonna listen, 
and that she's going to come up with a real solution to address it. And so, again, I'm running for mayor to be that independent voice. I'm not running to make friends, but I am running to earn your vote. I want everyone to know that I truly believe in the opportunities of this city. And we can't afford to have someone who is learning on the job. We need somebody who's a proven leader. We need somebody who is ready on day one. And I'm that candidate. And so I hope that you will go to my website, divineformayor.com, to learn more about my policy proposals, learn more about my experience, but most importantly, share with me your ideas. Because as mayor, I'm not gonna tell you that I'm gonna know every single thing, but what I am gonna tell you is I'm gonna work with you and for you so that we can work together to address the opportunities and make sure that Columbia is an amazing place to live, work, and raise a family. Imagine a Columbia, imagine. Imagine a Columbia where an honest day's work equals an honest day's pay. Where you don't have to dream about starting your own business. You have a city that's right there to help you accomplish it, make sure that you are, is investing right there along with you. Imagine a Columbia where you don't have to worry about your child or your grandchild having to move to Charlotte or Atlanta or to New York. They're gonna be able to reach their God-given potential right here in Columbia. Imagine a Columbia that protects you from COVID-19, no matter what the governor says. Imagine a Columbia where healthcare is as accessible and affordable in 29205 or in Shandon as it is all across this country. Imagine a Columbia where you don't have to worry about gun violence. Imagine a Columbia, guys, where you don't have to worry about your kids or your grandkids being locked up for simple possession of marijuana. Imagine a Columbia where you are able to get your potholes fixed as soon as you notice them, where grocery stores get built in your neighborhood, where you don't have to worry about elected officials who are lining their own pockets, where you're able to make sure that, that the city that you love and that you care about has a future that also matches it. I'm running for mayor because I care, because I want to make sure that we are moving the needle here for Columbia, that we have the future that we deserve. My name is Sam Johnson, and I'm running for mayor. Thank you for this discussion this evening. I'm looking forward to earning your vote as mayor. You can find out more about us at www.samjohnsonformayor.com. You can see the policies that we've put on the table. You can see how we plan on leading this city forward. Thank you so much to the Columbia Urban League Young Professionals, to Allen University, and to WLTX for airing this and giving us this opportunity this forum this evening. Thank you. Let's give all of our candidates another huge round of applause. That is all the time we have for this candidates forum on air. But we do want to remind you that election day is Tuesday, November 2nd. And you can get all of your election results as well as information on each of the candidates that you heard from today on our website at WLTX.com. That's going to do it for us on air, but we invite you to follow us on social media as we will continue this debate, this forum, this conversation for another 30 minutes on social media. For now, we're going to wrap things up. Thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of News 19 at 7. But we do invite you to stay seated if you can. We're going to continue the discussion with our candidates. We had quite a few questions from viewers that we did not get answered during that hour. So we're going to try to get through these on 30 minutes of social media. If you have friends or family who were watching at home, we invite you to send them a text message and let them know that they can find us on WLTX.com as well as our Facebook page. All right, so we're going to do this in alphabetical order again. We're going to start with you, Mr. Bedora. All right. I'll give you all about one minute if you need to clear the room so that we can make sure that the candidates are given the time, the respect uh, that they need. Take about a minute. 
that was the plan. This worked out so well, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson said, I thought you, were all, you guys were going to let me get out of here. I said, the people want more. They want more of this. This is working out really well. All right, so here's a question from a News 19 viewer. We'll start with you, Mr. Bedora, and then continue to go in alphabetical order. And in the interest of time, I won't call on each of you individually if you'll just pick up. So this question from a News 19 viewer, as mayor, what does the future of public transportation look like, and where do you see bike lanes in the city? Oh, great question. I just had this conversation with uh, a, a bike lane or a bike activist, uh, and it's important that we can uh, we uh, create bike lanes uh, all over the city to connect all parts of the city. Uh, when I was on council, we've uh, approved a plan that we can address that uh, uh, need uh, and service for all the bicycles out there. And it's important that we put that plan in action and continue that connection between all neighborhoods and all parts of the cities. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, public transportation, when it comes to buses, I think it's important that we work with the Richland County or the bus system and, and create more lines and more uh, bus routes throughout the city uh, to connect the city more and more, uh, more together. At the same time, we need to look at ways if we can connect our city to uh, our neighbor city, as in Orangeburg, Charlotte, Charleston, and everywhere through uh, a rail or a train uh, that we can uh, bring people back in and out of our city. Thank you. That is a great question. Um, public transportation, we have to understand that we have to embrace multimodal transportation. That means, of course, our buses. It means uh, walk pedestrians, make sure that we have bicycles, uh, and that we do have high-speed rail and other uh, transportation. So that we look at looking um, having uh, transportation between our cities, um, not only through rail, but also stop and ride, park and ride op options. Um, our RTA has already been working towards that multimodal concept. And I spoke with a board member just today, and they're looking towards that, and they're looking at a new director. And once that new director is on board, uh, they will be working towards that. But it is very important that we have a mayor that is in constant communication, not just uh, with the RTA, but all of our regional partners, because it is a regional transportation authority. So we need a leader that's going to push forward. As far as bike lanes, as a member of the National League of Cities Board of Directors, I've lobbied for money, and we've gotten $40 million to implement our Walk Bike Columbia plan. So that will go a long way, not just for our walk and bike lanes, but also our greenway. So I'll tell you, we need to make sure that we are uh, embracing technology as we look at our Comet system. So making sure that it's convenient for folks to ride, making sure that they can be uh, as efficient and productive as they need to be and want to be. Utilizing our bus system, if you travel to other cities, you'll see folks who are riding the bus and able to access Wi-Fi and able to access some of the amenities and things that we have as, as, as sacrosanct in our communities these days. So we've got to make sure that we have a very technologically advanced bus system. But I'll tell you guys, we aren't going to be able to get there if we don't have consistent funding. Some of you may remember that, uh, some of us who are a little older remember that SCANA uh, used to fund our bus system. And then we had the penny. Well, in 2022, that ends. So we've got to look at how are we going to consistently fund our, our bus system. Now, as it relates to uh, bicycle and uh, pedestrian safety, we've got to make sure that we're looking at infrastructure that provides bump outs, that we are reassessing our timing of our lights so that people can uh, traverse across our wide streets safely. But we have to make sure we are, are looking at uh, things that create road diets so that we get some of these cars off the street as well. Perfect. Next question, beginning with Ms. Isaac Devine. What considerations or implications can you commit to fulfilling within the next 10 years? Oh, wow. Um, there are a lot of things in the next 10 years. One of the things uh, in my first, first priority on day one will be uh, to expand looking at uh, the equity within our city and making sure we're making strategic investments in that. Um, as uh, the leader at council, I, I led a, a citywide conversation earlier this year on the color of law, and after that, I proposed and my, my colleagues agreed that we uh, do an equity survey, which we have just gotten the results from. This will be an opportunity for us to have a real strategic plan about equity within our city and make very strategic, bold investments in communities that have been disinvested in. And so as that's the first commitment I'll make. And that, over the next 10 years, you'll see the fruits of that because you'll see strategic investments, real investments, 
Uh, so when you want to look at the growth of Bull Street, imagine if a fraction of that money is used for North Main or Monticello or other areas of this city. We can really address our health disparities, our food deserts, you know, lack of sidewalks and everything, and build strategic businesses uh, that will grow in those communities. So day one, I hire a chief health officer. I will make sure that you know, as we look at some of these inadequacies, inadequacies these, uh, these health care outcomes that have been horrible for, uh, unfortunately, too many of us across the city, losing folks 10 years shorter in one side of the city than, than the other, I'll make sure that we take the first step to make sure that, that that stops, that we address that issue head on. The second thing I'll do, guys, is I will, first of all, make sure that when, look, when we look at public safety, the 93 police officers that we're missing right now, the over 60 firefighters that we don't have going up and down these streets on fire trucks, I'll make sure that I hire those folks day one, making sure that we have the public safety infrastructure that we need, the bodies that we need to keep our children safe, keep our families safe, making sure that if you, if you call 911 and your house is on fire, they have the tools necessary to put it out. So those are the things that I'll do immediately as mayor. So the next 20 years, um, as I mentioned before, I want to make Columbia, South Carolina, the city to make your American dream come true. Why do I say that? I say that because of a lot of reasons. Columbia is a great place to be to make your American dream come true. We need to make sure our streets are safe, our community police are in our neighborhoods, our substations are in every neighborhood around every corner in our street. We need to know our police officers so our police officers can you know our community. We need to understand the value of corruption and how we can stop that and eliminate any waste of tax for money. Look, we work hard. I am just like you. I work every single day to make ends meet. It is important that we address the expenses and all the taxes and fees that we pay to pay for the government to keep operating. Time to give the citizens a break. Make Columbia the dream city for everybody to achieve their American dream. Thank you. Thank you. This next question, we'll begin with you, Mr. Johnson. What are you going to do differently as mayor compared to previous administrations? Well, uh, you know, the first thing, we've talked about health care a lot. Uh, I see the city's role in health care uh, is, is something that we have to address. Guys, we can talk about economic development. We can talk about so many different things. But that conversation is null and void if everybody's dead. We've got to make sure that we're keeping our folks safe, that we are making sure that they have healthy lives. So we have to address some of these things, guys. We can't continue to have them be uh, outlying conversations that go for decade and decade. We have to make sure we are taking these conversations off the table. Uh, I'll tell you another. Uh, we have to make sure that we have a mayor who is able and willing to address education here in Columbia. We are going to be able to see the economic development and recruitment that we want to see, the growth that we want to see here in Columbia, if we don't have companies that are willing to bring jobs and investment here in Columbia because their employees don't want to enroll their children in our school districts. So we have to make sure that we have top high quality education available to all of our children right here in Columbia. Can you repeat the question? Yes, sir. What are you going to do differently as mayor compared to previous administrations? Um, I wish I can roll back the clock and take uh, uh, the hundred hundred million dollar we spent on Bull Street. Uh, I think we can utilize a hundred million dollar all over the city to improve our quality of life, uh, to bring grocery stores in uh, food desert areas, to uh, bring the quality to improve the quality of life all over the city. Uh, it is important that we address uh, and listen, listen to the people that elected you in office, and find out what their concerns are and address them rather than force a vote or force a stadium into somewhere that it doesn't belong. It's important that we give the people a break, not go up on the water rates in the middle of a pandemic because you have to. It is important that we listen to you guys. It's important that you, whoever you put us in office, we address and listen to your concerns and follow your wishes and demands. Thank you. You know, um People always tell me, they look at the fact that they're like, you would be the first female mayor. And I always say, I'm not running uh, to be the first female mayor, but one of the things I do say is that, I don't say women lead better than men, but I, we do lead differently. And so when I look at my leadership style, as opposed to Mayor Benjamin or Mayor Coble, uh, I am solution oriented. I'm someone who does not uh, worry about rolling up my sleeves and getting to work with people. Uh, I am not about a title, um, and I'm not about 
uh, forcing people um, and saying, it's, I have my four votes, I'm gonna move forward. I believe in leading in a way that you bring forward, and you bring solutions. A real leader brings people along with her. A real leader takes, takes all ideas and comes up with a real solution to hit the problem. And so as mayor, I will be that solution-oriented mayor, someone who is not scared to tackle the real problems and not just wait for four votes and say, we're going to move forward, but say, how do we bring people together? And not just in the city, but our region, because we have to have a mayor who's going to lead this region for us to move forward. All right, our next question. <laughs> Go to Mr. Medora. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> As I told you guys, I'm busy communicating with my producer back in, in the studio, so I lost track of who was next. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Bedore, you will answer this question first. What will you do as mayor to keep costs down for people who are living in the city? Uh, great question. Number one, um, I will uh, stop any water rate increases for the next four years. Uh, number two, we will find ways for you to enjoy our city with our, our parks without paying any fees anywhere you go. Uh, it is important that we keep our expenses to a, to a minimum and everything that we spend from taxpayers' money out in the public for people to understand where every dollar is spent and it's going. It's, impor it's important that we address the concerns that everybody has for the public that elected us to be here. Uh, it, 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 we, we, have, we have to eliminate business license fee for small businesses to bring more businesses into our city and employ more young people in our, in our city to stay here and raise their families. Thank you. You know, to keep costs down, number one, we have to certainly grow our tax base. The way we do that is not by cutting, but how do we uh, make strategic investments to grow our city. Uh, when we first did the tax study last year, uh, a lot of folks went out and talked about, oh, taxes are high and this might be one reason or another. The first thing I did is I reached out to our partners at the county and reached out to both school districts and to our county assessor to understand the taxing structure and how we can work together. Uh, and so as mayor, I would do that and make sure that we're looking at um, working together with our regional partners in order to keep costs down, because it's not just about the city. If you live here, whether you live in the city of Columbia, Richland County, Lexington County, it all makes a difference, and so we have to work together. Another, re another thing is in 2007, I championed uh, an efficiency study at the city of Columbia to make sure that we were cutting our costs and making strategic investments, and that helped us as we came out of the recession in 08, 09. Uh, this year, we have implemented uh, uh, equity-based budgeting. And so if you're utilizing those types of tools like efficiency studies, equity-based budgeting, you are going to keep the cost down for the taxpayers. So and I agree with Councilwoman Devine. I would tell you uh, we've got to be very focused on how we grow. But I will tell you, if you look uh, and uh, analyze some of our peer cities, the Austin, Texas of the world, the Raleigh uh, of the world, the Nashvilles of the world, they have economic toolkits. They have something that allows them to attract investment. Uh, one of the things that we have to do here in Columbia is we have to have a toolkit. We won't be in the game, guys, if we don't have something to play with, right? We've got to make sure that we have uh, something that allows for us to attract the type of growth that we want to see here in Columbia. And so uh, as mayor, you've got to be focused on economic development. We've got to make sure that we are strategically investing in this city uh, and as we have opportunities to, to do things like developing our rivers, uh, to uh, expand our convention center, we've got to look at how that plays in overall in the, in the totality of the city. But then we also have to make sure that how do, we make sure, uh, how do we ensure that that happens in our communities, in our neighborhoods? How are we making sure that we can create the type of density that allows for us to have the growth that powers our neighborhoods and our schools as well? Thank you. As I mentioned, we are now live on social media, so our next question is from a viewer who is watching online. Ms. Devine, this viewer wants to know, would you advocate to build a health services response team into the police department? Oh, okay, great question, um, and I've already started that. Uh, I mentioned in a previous question when we were online that we have hired a social worker. Um, as in my day job, I'm an attorney, and part of my practice is I work um, in the mental health field. And I see our brothers and sisters every day that are dealing with mental health challenges. Uh, some diagnosed, some undiagnosed. Some people are dealing with um, adverse childhood experiences. Some folks are dealing with a post-traumatic stress disorder. And so uh, law enforcement is called out a lot of times when they shouldn't be. 
And so best practices is to make sure we have a multidisciplinary unit uh, that you can have healthcare professionals within um, the police department to help. And so we do have a social worker, Angie, uh, who started about a month ago and is working, and she responds to these calls with our officers so that they can meet people where they are. Uh, as, as mayor, my um, job would be to expand that unit and make sure that we have other professionals within our law enforcement that they're working together with our law enforcement so our law enforcement can be focused on law enforcement issues and healthcare professionals can be uh, there to deal with other issues. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we put out a, a very specific uh, public safety plan back in April. That plan called on not only the, for the city to have a social worker, uh, but to make sure that we have the mental health professionals available to make sure that we are targeting and addressing some of these challenges head on, making sure that we don't have police officers who are addressing uh, some of these mental health uh, and uh, other challenges that, that right now we have uh, police officers going to and responding to. Uh, and so our public safety plan shows how we have to make sure that we are doing things like our sheriff's department, for example where our sheriff's department has a strategic relationship with the Department of Mental Health, where they're able to not only hire, but bring in other professionals who have that expertise, who are able to make sure that we are triaging folks and getting them to the places, to the services that they need and provide the care uh, that allows them to get back on their feet. Mr. Bedora. Um, absolutely. Um, I think it's important that we support our police officers in any tool that we have in the toolbox. Uh, it's important that we give them all the support they need. Um, as, uh, as a police officer, um, the things that they see and they witness and they deal with every day, uh, it's not a normal day for any worker. Uh, it is important that we give them the support they need. Uh, as we've done before, uh, I think in, 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 during my council uh, and my term on council, uh, we've uh, cross-trained uh, firemen uh, to be a EMS uh, driver or EMS uh, uh, officials or personnel to deal with uh, emergency cases like that. And I think it, maybe we should uh, look at that possibility also uh, and to cross-train some of the police officers to uh, play a role in an emergency situation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question, again, from another viewer who is joining us online. To all the candidates, what do you plan to accomplish in your first 100 days? I think we had something similar a little earlier. Uh, I talked about our chief health officer, and I'll make this extremely quick since we <laughs> kind of talked about it, but um, I talked about public health and how we have to move the needle there. I talked about public safety and how we have to make sure that we are closing the, uh, the vacancies that we have in our fire department and our uh, in our police department. So those are things that I, I think we have to address immediately to, uh, to make sure not only are we dealing with public, uh, public health, but public safety. Um, and I'll tell you guys, uh, as we look at the first 100 days, you know, we are dealing with one of the most uh, challenging times, the greatest pandemic since 1918. And so we have to have uh, a mayor who's willing to listen uh, to uh, professionals, uh, to folks who have expertise, who have data behind them. So as we deal with the, the number of variants that uh, that we are seeing attack our children, uh, that uh, are uh, averse to all of the different vaccinations that we have right now, we've got to make sure that the next mayor is willing and able to attack and lead on this issue immediately. Um, uh, the first week I take office, we will start Operation Clean Sweep Columbia. We will go after corrupt politicians and mishandling of public money. Number two, we will, I will eliminate the mayor's office budget of $750,000 a year and give that money to police officers so we can recruit more officers to our city and fulfill our vacancies. Number three, we need to make sure that we stop the water rate increases for the next four years so we can, people can, give, can get a break from paying fees and necessary fees that we need to to keep them going and keep food on their table. It is important that we bring public safety to our neighborhood. It is important that we open police substations in our neighborhood to strengthen the relationship between our officers and our communities and young people. It is important that we reach out that, to reach out to our younger people and prevent them from committing any crime before it happens. Thank you. Um, I would start, I mentioned before, the equity action plan, um, but having the equity action plan to help drive our budgeting decisions, because uh, we will start the budget uh, shortly after the mayor takes office. 
uh, in addition to that, look at our infrastructure and how do we make strategic investments in our infrastructure. Uh, repairing roads that our city owned and working with DLT for the state roads to make sure that those are repaired. Uh, and putting sidewalks in communities that don't have them and making those strategic investments in equi and, uh, an equitable way throughout this city. Also look at how do we expand and reimagine policing in a way that really addresses crime in our, in our communities, whether it's gun safety issues, whether it's domestic violence, making sure that our law enforcement not only have the tools, but that we also are um, keeping them. You know, there's a lot of talk about the vacancies with the police department, but when you look at how many officers we've lost, the majority of those officers have actually left law enforcement altogether. This is a really tough time for officers, and we have to make sure that we are incentivizing staying in the profession and making it professional like it has, has been in the past. And so as mayor, I will be, make sure we're championing that. Thank you. Now this next question is for a viewer who is also watching us online, and it seems like this person probably did pretty well in their civics class. All right, you all will be able to answer this question because you'll understand it. Um, some of our folks in the audience, it may be a little too inside baseball for them, but here's the question. How do the candidates feel about the system as it is, the current system of mayor, or do they think we need a strong mayoral system because we now have a city manager and the mayor is only one vote on council? So this is someone who understands the politics behind a strong mayor and a weak mayor system in Columbia. Mr. Vador. Oh, um, I am. I, I am for um, <laughs> manager council form of government. I am not for strong mayor uh, form of government. Uh, but we defeated that uh, motion on that uh, uh, back in I don't know how many years ago, uh, for a good reason. Uh, I think the manager uh, for, uh, manager council form of government it is the proper governing for this city, and the reason is simple. Uh, when you have a, a strong mayor, uh, it leads into corruption. When you have a strong mayor, it leads into powerhouse and what the strong mayor can do. It's important that we get all our council members from every district around the city to pose or pro propose their ideas and their needs to our council and to the mayor to have things done. It is not one man's vision. It is the city's vision and all council members. That's why I'm all for manager council form of government. Uh, the voters decided years ago uh, to keep the council manager form of government. That is having a professional manager, someone who understands the day-to-day -day operations, and then having a mayor that can help drive the vision of the city and implement and help bring resources. Uh, and that is the position I'm running for. Uh, you don't need a strong mayor form of government to be a strong mayor. Um, I, have, um, I know that I can be a very strong leader uh, without changing the form of government. One thing that we know about our current form of government, 421, that was implemented many years ago is so that we can have um, equitable um, access to uh, our elected officials. Uh, many, many years ago, we had so many elected officials who were in one area of the town, and we are still seeing the results of that here when you talk about disinvestment. And so I believe in the council manager form of government, and I think you need a very strong leader to be that mayor, and I am that strong leader. Well, I'll tell you, uh, that conversation uh, occurred in 2013, and uh, I'm not up here to, to debate that conversation. Um, I've had the pleasure, I'm the only person who's uh, standing up here, uh, or uh, even Councilman Rickman, uh, including him, who's actually served as staff uh, in the mayor's office. And I will tell you, um, I would prefer uh, the Shaw mayor uh, personally. I think uh, the one example I would utilize is if you guys uh, were to submit a FOIA, a Freedom of Information request, and you look at how many phone calls the city manager's office gets versus how many calls the city, uh, the mayor's office gets, it's not even a comparison at all. Uh, you call the mayor. You know, most citizens don't recognize that they have a city manager. They know they have a mayor. Uh, now, I will tell you guys, I think I can be effective uh, uh, under either uh, form of government, and I agree with Councilman Devine. I've had the pleasure of working with two strong mayors, uh, Mayor Benjamin, and now working with Mayor Coble at Nexon Pruitt. Thank you. This next question, again, submitted from an online viewer. The current mayor made it mandatory for all city employees to be vaccinated in order to maintain employment. The question, do you agree or disagree, and why or why not? 
And so just one correction, that was actually um, under accounts manager form of government, the city manager uh, is in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. And so operationally uh, and looking at the cost uh, to the city, the cost to the taxpayers to have employees that are unvaccinated uh, is a significant cost. And so upon uh, the city manager's recommendation, it was a recommendation made to the mayor and members of council to incentivize vaccines um, and to ask that if people are not vaccinated that they uh, per submit uh, a, a negative test every 72 hours. Uh, and incentivizing, they get a cash investment. And I did support that and I still do support that. We know to fight COVID-19, we need to encourage more vaccinations. Uh, but we also need to make sure that people um, understand that if they are not vaccinated, that is a personal choice. But when you are in a service industry and you are adding to that, that is a taxpayer cost. Right now, the, uh, the healthcare costs alone, the number of firefighters that we have out because of COVID-19, the firefighter that we just lost to death of COVID-19 is a tremendous issue uh, for our citizens. And so I do agree. I tell you, to me, I look at it uh, as a, as I would a personal decision uh, for my family. And uh, I started this conversation out this evening talking about uh, COVID and how it's impacted my family. Um, I lost my aunt, as I mentioned, and I remember what it was like saying goodbye to her while she was on the ventilator. Um, and when I think about our first responders, our uh, police and fire, for example, who don't have an option, uh, you know, while we were all quarantining for this year and a half, they had to go out and respond. They didn't get any time off, any days off. They had to be out there in the pipe. Um, and so about a week or so, a uh, week and a half or so, before the city uh, decided to make that decision, before council voted, uh, which I think was unanimous, uh, to, to require uh, folk, uh, city staff to, to get vaccinated, we called on the city to do so. I, I wholeheartedly uh, support that and think we have to do everything in our power to keep people safe and healthy, uh, and especially uh, folks that we care about. Um, so, yeah, I support the vaccination of uh, city employees and incentive they received uh, when completing their vaccination. It's funny, I made that comment or I made that, uh, I, I issued or talked about this idea two weeks before city council passed it uh, last week. Uh, it, it is important to incentivize people to get vaccinated, vaccinated because we have to lead by example. City employees, city council, and mayor has to lead by example. Now, if some other people don't have uh, do not have strong feeling about the vaccine, that is your choice. We can't force you into it, but we can incent give you an incentive for you to go get vaccinated and be safe and be safe around other people so you don't have to worry about whether you get uh, infected or not. It is important that we lead by example, and that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. And our final question from our online audience this evening. Given the proximity of Charlotte and Atlanta, which, what niche can Columbia car for itself for further development and expansion? Well, it's important to know, I guess that's my, my, that's my question. It's important to know kind of where you stand and where you stack up, right? Uh, so we look at Columbia, there's always a comparison between Greenville and Charleston. And that's, we can have that conversation. We can talk about Charlotte and Atlanta. We can talk about, uh, I mentioned uh, Knoxville. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Austin, Texas, a capital city that also has a river. I talked about Raleigh, uh, also a capital city just north of us. We can have those conversations, but I think we have to look at what our natural assets are. We have all these higher ed institutions. How do we make sure that we're leveraging them? How do we make sure that as folks graduate here, that we're tapping into those knowledge economy jobs that they just got trained for? Um, I think that is, is, how, you know, is what we have a natural opportunity to leverage and utilize here. Uh, you know, we look at uh, for example, Charleston with Boeing and Greenville uh, uh, with manufacturing, what we have an opportunity to really lead and what our identity is, uh, is what the next mayor has the opportunity to, to define as a city. And so we've got to make sure that we're addressing that. Um, so we, um, Columbia is a unique of its own way. Uh, we're not Charlotte, we're not Atlanta. But we can get better than Charlotte and Atlanta by having community policing back in our community improve our public safety everywhere in the city, make our, street, make our streets safe, eliminate business license fee for small businesses. Neither one of those cities, Charlotte or Atlanta, offer that. We can offer that so we can attract more businesses and more individuals to come to our city and open small businesses, hire young people so they can work at the businesses and enhance their lifestyle. 
It is important that we improve our water and sewer infrastructure and keep our costs down so people from Charlotte and Atlanta come to Columbia for all those reasons. It is important that we end any corruption or even the smell of a corruption in our city because it is the way people preserve our, or see our city, it is not very good and we need to improve our image. Thank you. You know, we are Columbia. Uh, the city is unique. We have lots of amazing resources, we have great people, and we have great opportunities. And so we need to stop trying to be someone we're not and embrace what we are. Um, you know, I talk about a lot that um, I want to create a, an 880 city, a city that is good for people age eight and paid, uh, age 80 and everybody in between. That is quality of life. You want to make sure that you are building uh, not just your um, understanding our natural resources, but also building an ecosystem that supports people that as they're young, they want to grow old here and they want to stay here. Uh, and so we have to understand, you know, we have great universities and great talent here. We've got to retain that talent. We have to invest in our infrastructure so we have strong infrastructure. We have to have a great quality of life. Uh, and so for Columbia, we need to understand we are a government town but the government doesn't have to drive everything. We need to build the infrastructure that allows people to build a business, to grow a business, um, and have jobs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another huge round of applause for all of our candidates. I thank each of you so much for your attention today and for sharing this on social media. It would not have been the success that it is tonight if it were not for your engagement. To the president of this university, Dr. McNeely, thank you so much. Dove Taylor, we appreciate your assistance with us here at WLTX. And of course, to the Urban League, thank you so much for your partnership. A round of applause to them as well. This will wrap our portion of the program as per WLTX. We're no longer online, we're no longer on air, but we cannot wrap up without giving Ilana Frazier an opportunity to come forward and speak to you all about how wonderful tonight has been. Ilana. <laughs>